Man, I love me some Christian music. And I love me some Christmas music. <laughs> and that last song, 10,000 Reasons, I think I have that since I woke up this morning. My goodness, 10,000, is that it? Well, we are going to continue our study in the book of Acts. Y'all are probably going to hear me say that for the next two years, I'm thinking. Uh, so I may just have to skip that introduction and just say, you know, you know. But that's where we're going to be today. And as we were in the middle of uh, chapter 5 uh, last week, uh, we got to see one of those progress reports of how the church was doing at, at its early inception. Uh, we, we got to see why the Holy Spirit was able to come down upon this group of people, this group of believers, and we saw that was because they were united with one heart, one mind, and they were united under that banner of Christ Jesus. And that opened the door for the Holy Spirit to rain down on them and work through them. And we got to see the opportunity uh, for them to proclaim the gospel. Had some two big revivals before they even had their first church service. They already needed a revival. And 3,000 came to Christ. 5,000 at the second came to, came to Christ. And then we saw the lame man healed. But then reality set in, as it does. We saw some of that turbulence take place, both from outside the church with the, the Sanhedrin. Uh, that was their first, I guess, dealings with outside sources trying to tear down this fledgling church. Persecution, as we would we'd give it name to. And then we got to see that transpire from the within with Ananias and Sapphira. How <coughs> Satan can use outside resources and he can use inside resources to do damage within the body of Christ. And we said, uh, uh, you heard me say that persecution, turbulence from the outside of the church draws the church closer together. Empowers the church, strengthens the church. Even though we're under conflict, when that takes place inside, that's when, just, that's when separation takes place. That's when true disruption takes place. And then in the middle of that, uh, that progress report, we saw that even in the midst of this persecution, when, they, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees said, do not speak anymore in this name, their boldness and their devotion to their Lord and Savior said, hey, we can't do anything but. Take that for what you will. We'll see you. You know. So, beautiful place where we're at right now in the book of Acts. Uh, today, we are going to be driving, and I'm glad my wife stepped out so I can use, we are going to be driving in the passing lane this entire day. Uh, as far as this service goes, because we've got a lot of ground to cover. And uh, I don't know if y'all have ever seen that poor woman driving down the road, but oh my. She should have joined the Air Force and, drove, and flew jets or something like that, because that, that woman drives like a maniac, bless her heart. <laughs> and you know, you know how God is. He's got... The, he has a sense of humor, and I know each and every one of y'all, especially in marriages, can re relate. I am the polar opposite. I'll drive on the shoulder. I want to drive that slow. That's the way I, and she, it drives her crazy just to, to be with me in, uh, when I'm behind the wheel. But before we get into God's Word, let's, uh, let's receive the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much again for this day. Lord, as we open up your Word so that we can commune with you, that we can hear you speak to us through your gospel, through your word. 
Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit would give us the ability to receive this truth exactly for what it is. And Lord, that that same Holy Spirit would embolden us to proclaim this truth into our workplaces, our school places, wherever life may take us throughout this next week, that we would carry you, whether it be in word or deed, wherever we go. Lord, we thank you, and we surrender ourselves to you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. So again, we are looking at uh, verse 17 of chapter 5. That's where we're going to start. And we are going to, I'm going to try to rock it all the way through to finish out chapter 5. Not because we're on some kind of program or some time frame or whatever, but it just fits as a whole when we do it when, in this, this particular part of Scripture. So starting in verse 12, it says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs, I'm sorry, 17, then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in common prison. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple, speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard it, and when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. And we're going to stop right there and go back and dissect this just a little bit because there's a few highlights we need to uh, pinpoint before we go on. One of the things you notice in verse 17 is the high priest rose up in indignation. And I, that is a strong word. Indignation. That is a, an opposing fervor that is highly fueled. And these that were of the Jewish nobility, the hierarchy within the, the, the temple structure, they're not just indignant, they're indignant because they're jealous. They are indignant because they see multiple members. Remember, we talked about 8,000 just at this point, if not more, that weren't, uh, weren't mentioned. 8,000 that are turning from the Jewish religion to this Christian religion. And there, you know, there's got to be somewhere in the back of their mind, they're scratching their head saying... This is a sect of the Jews, which is what the, what the Roman officials actually thought, that this was just a part of the Jewish church. So they didn't see any threat there. You know. However, the Jews were like, hey man, these guys are using our temple and proclaiming this Jesus Christ as Messiah. So essentially, we're funding this. And we're going to see... We're going to see that, that a rift take place uh, in the chapters to come. We're going to see that division starting to become more prevalent. And if you stop and think about that, nowadays, let's just take to put that in context to today. We just alluded to it earlier when I spoke about each of the churches, Christian churches, out there as an independent team. And unfortunately, we're so busy fighting against and playing against one another that the loss that we are supposed to be corporately going after are just as lost as they were yesterday. And the, what's, what's really sad is you see a lot of churches not wanting to unite together in this day and age, because some they may take one of our members. Or you don't want to participate in something else because what if I like their service better? Wow. Isn't that, isn't that a joke? Mm. But that's definitely not the case with these Sadducees. They're not having it. They are not having it. 
So much so in verse 18, you see here, it says they laid their hands on them. And they didn't have a service where they, hey, we're going we're gonna to bless them and praise them and send them off. This isn't that kind of laying on hands, guys. This is, uh, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to rough you up a little bit between here and the jailhouse. However, one of the things you notice right here, it doesn't say what was taking place when these guys are arrested, as we'll, we'll read on. There's, so apparently it must have been a very low-key kind of thing because we'll see later on that these authorities, these police officers, so to speak, of the, of the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, they do rough them up later. But right now they have the power of the people because like we talked about before, not only are the, uh, those that are becoming Christians being blessed, but those even outside of the church are being blessed because these Christians are living it out. And they, the blessings are a byproduct of all those that are around them. So they got roughed up a little bit, got thrown in the common prison. And I love this. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said. Some of your translations may say the angel of the Lord, but I think that's a misinterpretation. It is an, an angel of the Lord. When you, when you think of the angel of the Lord, it's Christ Jesus manifesting himself in the Old Testament. This is an angel of the Lord. But there's, there's beauty in that because understand from the apostles' viewpoint, they are Jewish. And they are at a place where they're trying to figure out, okay, how much of this do we shrug off and how much of this do we keep as we go into this new faith belief? Because if you stop and think about it, everything that's under the law is works, whether you realize it or not. You, because you have to work to abide by that, those laws. You could pick any three of those, and I'd let y'all choose, and I'd mess them up. Guaranteed. But there were hundreds. So to have an Old Testament event being having a, an angel of the Lord visit upon them had to be a reassurance to them. Hey, we are still abiding by the first half of this book, even though they didn't have that compiled. But this was a reassurance to them that the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. The Christ that you serve and surrendered your life to is the same Christ that was pointed to time and time and time again throughout this Old Testament Scriptures. That is a profound, profound statement in verse 19. And he brought them out. There's a whole study that we could do about how the physicality of an angel, a messenger of the Lord, the physicality allowed them to do and perform things that the Holy Spirit indwelt within us could not. And we'll have to, we'll have to make that maybe a source of Wednesday night Bible studies if we ever get out of the... Uh, the other ongoing state that we're in now with the seven feasts of the Lord. And he, what's beautiful is he didn't tell them, hey, turn around and go do something different. This angel of the Lord said, keep on keeping on. In modern, modern vernacular, he said, you keep doing you, boo. That's where we're at. And what's beautiful is you have to understand the temple, that's where people went before they branched out into their daily lives. It wasn't something, it wasn't a, an event that, oh my goodness, it's, it's, it's 5 o'clock Sunday evening, or it's 10 o'clock Sunday morning, or it's 6 o'clock Wednesday evening. Oh God, you know, it wasn't that. That was the very first part of their day. And they hit the temple, and then they went about their daily duties, work, or whatever the case may be. You notice how they had their priorities in the right place. They may not have been taught the right thing, 
the right message. They may not have been con being conveyed to or com conveyed upon what it is that they needed to do to live a righteous life. However, they were hungry and they were devoted and they made that a priority. We've got a lesson to learn from that. So they got there in verse 21, first thing in the morning, and they're back to doing what God has called them to do. They are proclaiming Jesus Christ. And one other thing you'll see in 21, it says the council was called together with all the elders of the children of Israel. One of the important aspects of that verse right there is before, when we had the persecution prior, that was what was called a quorum. That was not the full authority of the council. This, this right here, this is all 70. The full authority of the council of the temple. So starting to get serious. We're starting to build as these trials, these mock trials continue. Verse 22, it says, But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely, and the guards standing outside before the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. Let me stop right there a second, because... You have to understand how the prisons worked in these days. That prison guard who was over that particular prison, he was sort of bound in contract with those within the prison. And what that what I mean by that is, let's say you got a you owed a debt to society, which is what we sort of call it in our judicial system now and then. You owe taxes or something to that effect. And they said, you're going to stay in prison for three years to pay off this debt, whatever it may be. And let's just say that prisoner stayed one year and broke out. That jailer, that person that's over the prison, he is duty bound to serve out those remaining two years of that offender. Oh. When we'll see later on in Acts, We'll, I think it's Acts 22, we'll see that Paul has something like this take place too. And they're busted out of prison. And remember that Philippian jailer, he was about to fall upon his sword. Because he knew he was fixing to get in trouble. And they were like, no, 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 wait, we're still here. Same scenario here. When they say, when they, say they wondered what the outcome would be, they were wondering, hey, am I going to live past this day? What is, what's the penalty that's going to apply to me for these guys being out? So in verse 25, so one came and told him saying, Look, the men whom you're, you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. You know, that right there had to be first a relief because at least you know, hey, maybe I can get them back in prison. If you're small minded and just looking at that. Verse 26, then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence. Here we go. For they feared the people lest they should be stoned. Man. We talked about in Sunday school this morning an event that just took place here not long ago where someone had a baseball bat uh, within their clothing and walking down the street removed that baseball bat and nearly beat another person to death in the midst of multiple people. How much more so would it be if someone was out proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ and some event, life-threatening event fell upon them? The loss would probably not even flinch. Maybe not even stop to watch. But because the church in this instance was doing the work of Jesus Christ at such a degree, such a level that we can't comprehend today in our modern church that those around them were like, hey, we're not 
Christian, but we're all about what you're doing because it's, it's filling up our entire community. We are all benefiting from what you guys are doing. So much so that these temple guards said, hey man, we're, we're going to do this gently. This is going to be a PR move, as they would call it. To, and, you know, they probably maybe even grabbed an arm and a leg and carried those guys and said, hey, look, don't even, we don't even want you to stress out walking. We're going to take care of that because we do not want to be stoned. I love that. I hope, I pray in the days and years ahead that we come to be like this church. To where even the lost in our community say, don't you fool with North Keithfield Baptist Church. Or don't you fool with Radiant Life. Or don't you fool with First United Methodist Church. Because those are good people and they are doing the right thing. Whether you agree with it or not. Wouldn't that be beautiful? Verse 27, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest and asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach this in this name? And look, oh, this is beautiful too. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. That's a progress report from the opposing side right there. You have filled Jerusalem professing Jesus Christ. Man, man. Wow. And I'm going I'm to sort of point the finger at myself and men that are behind pulpits. There are churches in America today, in this state today, in this parish today, that they can't even say that about their own congregation. That we've filled this place with the name of Jesus Christ. So as much as, as the task of serving Christ Jesus is upon each and every one of us, individually, as part of a church, rest assured that those that stand behind one of these pulpits, even more so, If we continue to fail as preachers, as shepherds of flocks, if we continue to fail as we have over the last several decades, then we will never hear a proclamation of, you have filled this place with the name of Christ Jesus. That is my task that I believe God is... Like I've told you guys before, I've spent a half a lifetime running from it. And I don't know, this day isn't guaranteed for me. And if I'm given a half a lifetime ahead, I've got a lot to make up for. Because as believers in Christ Jesus, you've got to know that, hey, you know what? We bypass the great white throne of judgment, but there is a Bema seat that we will sit before. And our entire lives will be laid out before us. And we are going to have to give an account of why we, now listen to this word, chose not to pro proclaim Christ Jesus in various events in our life. We chose. We, as, once we became Christians... You know, I know, there have been times in our life when the conviction of the Holy Spirit was upon us and we denied it. And we're going to have to come to account for that. I don't want to just put the negative in there. There are going to be times whenever things that we did not even realize we did in the name of Christ Jesus will be there. And those crowns, I mean those uh, uh, jewels will be added to those crowns that we can lay before the Savior's feet. So I don't want to harp on just the negative, but I want us to be fully aware of it. That old saying, there's two sides of every coin, there surely is. And we need to be aware of what both of those mean.
I may have bypassed it. Um, you notice that this full group of the Sanhedrin, this full group came together and said, did we not strictly command you? So that alludes to this quorum. This quorum wasn't done on the side. There was no conniving being done, no manipulation of their standard. They put in a report. So now, this is building fervor against the Christians from the Jewish side. And I don't want y'all to take that wrong, thinking that this is where we need to be today, div divisive and the like. And that's the last thing we need. Because if you flip over to Revelations... Just do a little study, brief study. You'll find out that God's people, just like we mentioned this morning, God's people are still God's people. And He has still got a place and He's still got an end game with the Jewish people. And we need to be fully aligned with that as Christians. Verse 29, that boldness of Peter and the guys, man, just blows me away. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Man, you could just stop right there. You can stop right there. We could put that sign in neon out front and say we ought to obey God rather than men. And we are going to see in the days and months and years ahead that as our society breaks down due to focusing on the government instead of God, we are going to see this maybe take a wrong step. You know, we don't know what persecution means in the United States. We have no clue. No understanding. And it may not come in violence. You know, Satan... Satan has ways of adopting programs, so to speak, to make it to where it just is so subtle that we don't even realize it. It's taking place until it's taken us too far, further than we wanted to go. And we look back and we're like, man, I don't know exactly where we went wrong here. Hello. Hello. 200 years, 200, almost 250 years or so, as the United States founded strictly upon God's Word, and look where we are today. Isn't that something? And we're seeing it. We're seeing it today. We, talk, we had talks about uh, the, the, the church founding hospitals, the church founding orphanages, and all the things that the church did in the name of Christ Jesus to serve the community, to share the love of Jesus Christ, we've slowly but surely given those up to the government. Whether it be local, state, federal. And now we're not involved in them hardly at all. And how can we expect whenever the screws are tightened on us, as the church, as the body of believers... We can't expect that there'll be the community rallying around us because we are no longer serving the community. At this point, it's just a fight to stay alive ourselves. That's not what we see here. This stands that Peter and the apostles take that we ought to obey God rather than men. Verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus Christ whom you murdered by hanging on the tree. I love that Peter does not, he doesn't let up on that. And he uses every opportunity he can to witness to anybody. I mean, these guys, are, they could have his head in a heartbeat. And he's like, I don't care. Mm, I love that. Him, God has exalted to His right hand to be the Prince and Savior to give repentance to Israel 
and forgiveness of sins. You see how those two are put together right there? Your Old Testament and New Testament are interlocked right there. Forgiveness of God's chosen appointed people and forgiveness of sins all in one package. And we are His witnesses to these things and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. Well, I mean, you can go ahead and close the door right there, guys. It's, it don't get any, any better than that. We saw these things take place in the earthly ministry of Christ Jesus. We saw Him give His life for Christ Jesus. We saw Him resurrected. And we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to empower us to continue to proclaim Him as God's chosen Messiah. For His people, and like we talked about also this morning in Sunday school, and thank God for us Gentiles. We benefit. And we'll probably have to stop right here. I wanted to get this done because we're going to get introduced to a guy named Gamaliel that is part of this group, of this, this, the Sanhedrin. And he is going to play an instrumental part. As a matter of fact, at this point in time, he is playing an instrumental part in another gentleman that we're going to read about named Saul of Tarsus. So we'll give, we'll give him... His own Sunday, next Sunday, to, to, to lift him up because he gives some wise advice to this council. So as we're closing right there, guys, I think you saw a running thread throughout this lesson today. We have a choice today. Whether we have received Christ as our Lord and Savior, whether we're sort of dipping our toe into being a Christian, or whether we're all in, it is clear and evident what it is that we are to do with the days that we have remaining. It's Jesus Christ or it's nothing at all. Those two outcomes that Jimmy gave us this morning, it's very simple. Our, cho our choices stop with our last heartbeat. The choices we make today are what are going to determine our outcome for eternity. And that's a problem that you're going to find when you're witnessing to this society is that they know nothing but choices. We thought years ago, whenever, oh my goodness, we, got, we went from six kinds of cereal to 50 kinds. We had to make an, an aisle for cereal at the grocery store. And we were like, all right. But what that led to was choices and choices and choices expanding outside the grocery store into life. I don't feel this today, therefore I'm going to do this today. That is a self centered life. And you have taken God off His throne and placed yourself upon it. And that's a choice you'll regret. <laughs> I think you'll regret that choice even here on earth. The consequences are going to play out in your life. And I think it's going to be a little more than a flat tire, Jimmy. But even more so, you're going to spend an eternity regretting that choice. So today, that is what's before us. You have a choice today. You can either choose to surrender your life to Christ Jesus, or you can choose to serve yourself. That life lived for Christ Jesus is going to end up an eternity before God's throne. That other choice, there's no sugarcoating it, guys. That other choice leads to hell. And let's get, let's get past the flames. Let's get past the sulfur. Let's get past 
the torment that will take place even in your most lost time here on earth, God's presence can still be felt. There, it's gone. And without God's presence, there's no hope. And an eternity with no hope scares me to death. I've got, it gives me goosebumps to think about that. But those are your only two options today. We're going to have a time brief shot of music that I believe if you guys have something that is hindering you or you need the strength of the Holy Spirit to kick off the ministry that God has for you in your life, this altar is open. If you do not know Christ Jesus your Savior, this altar is open. Please, please, I beg you to choose. Father God, when it gets down to it, the choices are serious. And Lord, we have made the choice for you so cloudy and so muddy. by what we've added into it as if it's doctrine. And Lord, it is just a choice to surrender to God's only begotten Son. And as Your Word says, and whoever believeth on Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That simple. Lord, that thief on the cross beside You one was mocking, and one said, remember me, Lord. It was that simple. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would convict us in such a manner that we would surrender our choices in service of you that we would lean on You to be empowered to proclaim the name of Christ Jesus no matter where we go, no matter who we are in front of. That our fear, our timidity, those things would be removed from us. And that even the lost would benefit. As we close this service, Lord, we give this time for myself and those here, even those that will listen to this broadcast when it's put out, Lord, that we have that opportunity. Whether you come to this altar or whether you do it at home or right there where you're seated. Take an evaluation of whom you choose to serve this day. In the precious name of Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen.